Good morning. Uh, RBS, Royal Bank of Scotland, expected to be fined today for that involvement in the LIBOR rate fixing scandal. The fine will run into hundreds of millions of pounds, probably 400 million in total. Uh, it will certainly exceed the fine paid by Barclays, the first bank to admit to its role in rigging LIBOR. Barclays paying out just under £290 million. Swiss bank UBS, though, uh, got hit for just under a billion of the charges against its uh, Tokyo office. Head of RBS Investment Banking, John Hurricane, is to step down. Uh, they, we should say there's no suggestion he was personally involved in any rate fixing. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to the business secretary, Vince Cable, and I asked him if it was fair that RBS, more than 80% owned by us, the British taxpayers, should have to pay a fine to American regulators. Well, the problem was that when these offences occurred, we're talking probably five years or more ago, uh, they were a big business in the United States, and it, it would appear that they broke the laws of the United States and the penalties have been exacted. It is absolutely outrageous from the point of view of the British taxpayer who are lumbered with this obligation, but we're talking about something that occurred historically. Uh, the Chancellor made it very clear a few days ago that if fines have to be paid, they shouldn't be paid by the taxpayer or the customer. They should be paid by the staff, who are still pretty generously rewarded in that bit of the bank. Uh, but we are dealing with a, you know, a legacy problem here, and uh, un unfortunately, we're lumbered with the costs of the banks getting completely out of control in the build-up to the banking crisis at the end of 2008. Well, that was Vince Cable, Chris Robux, visiting professor at Cass Business School. Uh, Chris, morning, morning to you. RBS's share price is up this morning. Why has that happened, do you think? If you look at what's happened since Stephen Hester took over, he's actually done a, a pretty good job, as indeed has John Hurricane. And the bank has moved from being a basket case to getting to the point of being a break even. I think there's a, a, a worrying principle here that, as Vince Cable said, these are historical things that happened five years ago. But we're now in a position where the staff in the bank, who might not even have been in the bank or might not have had anything to do with it, and let's forget, you not forget we're talking about a very small number of people, will get paid less money as a result. Most people listening to this would not be terribly impressed if their boss said, I'm sorry, because somebody fiddled the accounts five years ago, you're not getting paid next month. Do you think that the culture of British banking has changed fundamentally over the past five years or so? I think what's happening is that it's focusing in more on the customer and acting ethically. But I go back to the point, if you look at the total number of people who are working in banking, maybe less than 1 or 2 per cent did anything wrong. The other 98 per cent throughout their entire careers have always acted with integrity and have always tried to serve their clients well. And that particular group of people are the group of people who are upset even more than the public about what this small group who've gone off the rails have done. It's worth saying also, Chris, isn't it, that we focused a lot on Barclays, we're focusing on RBS now, but there are plenty of other banks under investigation. Absolutely. You know, there's, there's 10 or 12 banks around the world that are being investigated either for involvement in LIBOR or involvement in the local rates that are then set from LIBOR wherever they happen to be. And the way that RBS is being treated, and in fact in terms of some of the ways that we're trying to control the banks in Europe, interestingly there are now comments that we could be getting to a point where eventually we'll have a two-tier banking system in the world. Those banks from America and from Asia who are able to do business in a pretty unfettered way and those in UK and in Europe who are tightly controlled and are not able to respond as quickly to the market as American and Asian banks and we know in Hong Kong there are Asian and American banks who are trying to poach people from British banks by saying we can give you bigger bonuses if you come and join us do so there are commercial implications to what we're trying to do Chris do you think that is that likely to happen sort of the epicentre of banking moving out from London, or is that something that banks based in London would like us to worry about? I think it's a combination of the two. The practicalities of a big bank leaving London are extremely large in terms of money, in terms of disruption, etc. London, the City of London is in the right place to have an international bank. 
Yes, I think some of the banks over-egg the pudding, but yes, if they get pushed too hard. The problem is not the people who leave London. Think about it. The problem is the really good people who, when offered the ability to come to London, say they don't want to. And those people are never in the statistics. But it's absolutely clear, you know, the city of London is the world's financial centre. And we need to appreciate that because New York and Hong Kong and Singapore, when British politicians consistently keep criticising the British financial services system and saying it's seriously flawed, they're the ones that get the money from the business that doesn't come here and they're loving this. <laughs> Chris Roebuck, thank you thank very you. much uh, indeed.